You're listening to The Cash Podcast, creating affluence, success, and happiness with your financial surgeon, Adam Coach, president and portfolio manager at Libertas Wealth Management Group at LibertasWealth.com. All right. Happy Monday, everybody. Before I get started today, I want to apologize in advance for my voice. It turns out I got double vaxxed with a side of COVID anyway. Um, And while I'm well out of quarantine at this juncture, my voice is still a little bit raspy. <clears throat> and I probably sound like I'm a little stuffed up. But anyway, um, I can't believe it's already the end of January and what a crazy, unprecedented, record-breaking January it's been. Uh, today, I'm just going to touch on a couple current events because I think they're important. Um, the market's had a terrible start to the year, and that's why I want to touch on those things. Um, but then I want to go and spend most of the time talking about why it's important to have a relatively boring investment portfolio and why investing should not be exciting, um, at least when it comes to your hard-earned, serious retirement savings, that is. But before we get started, as always, a few housekeeping items. First off, thanks so much for joining us. My hope is for you to learn a little bit more on each and every episode so that you become more successful, wealthier, happier, and above all, more educated than you were before you started listening today. So please come back often and subscribe. These episodes appear both on iTunes and YouTube. And you can also follow me on Twitter at Adam Koch and on Instagram at Financial Surgeon. Uh, Last but not least, all links, visuals, charts, additional educational resources They're always available on our website at libertaswealth.com in the education section. So let's go ahead and jump right in and get started here. Quote of the day, Peter Lynch. Uh, Peter Lynch said, everyone's got the brain power to do well in the stock market. The question is whether you have the stomach for it. And I think that that is a perfect quote for how this year has gone so far. Because how has this year gone? Well, it's been an ugly start. Um, The first 16 days of the month, being down 11% was the worst start going all the way back to the late 20s, early 30s. So it was the, the this has been the worst start for the market um, in almost all of history. Um, I say, I only say almost because I suppose there's a time um, prior to 1900 um, with uh, the Dow or we could go to the London Stock Exchange and maybe there's something worse overseas. But as far as the S&P 500 is concerned, we haven't seen anything uh, like this since uh, before the 30s. Um, If we look at just uh, the speed of the the drop that has occurred this year, correction is defined by a drop of 10% or more in the market, 10 to 20% we'll call it. Um, And on an intraday basis, this has been uh, in the top five drops. I just showed you that the 11% drop was as fast as it's ever been. Uh, But when we look at 1928 until current, um, on an intraday basis, in 15 days, the market went down this year 10%. Um, on an intraday basis was extremely fast. The uh, the other times that it moved down faster was January of 2018 in 13 days, January of 2009 in 12 days, and then January of 2016, it went down 12 days pretty quickly as well. Um, if we look at the market so far this year, uh, again, a really, really interesting way of looking at things is looking at uh, through the lens, looking at the market through the lens of uh, midterm election like se- seasonal patterns. So um, looking at the market through the lens of um, I'm not I'm sorry, this is this is the COVID brain talking here. It's looking at the market through the lens of seasonality and presidential election years. So the market uh, has a tendency to act and behave differently during a uh, election year, a pre-election year, a midterm election year, and a post-election year. And when we look at midterm election years, the market has a tendency to be a little bit weak for the first couple months of the year. Then we typically see kind of a rally into the uh, beginning of May. And then the market has a tendency to trade relatively flat to down right up until about mid-October or so once we get the midterm election. And once we have the midterm elections behind us, or at least we know, uh, the market knows, I should say, um, that uncertainty is gone when it comes to what's going to happen with the election at the, in the Senate and Congress, then the market has a tendency to rally through the end of the year. What we've seen this year so far, though, is, is um, if you're watching on YouTube, if you're not, if you're listening on iTunes, be sure to check this chart out on YouTube, um, is uh, Jeff Hirsch over at Stock Tra- Traders Almanac actually had to create a new chart just to show how low things had gotten um, and this isn't even through the end of February. This is this chart's a couple days old here, but he had to create a new chart because the averages hadn't had never been this low. So when we look at this year so far, what's this mean? Well, I hope it means that we get a nice big, huge charged 
rally or rebound, that would be really nice. I also ho hope that what we've seen uh, this past week is the low for the year. That's what I'm hoping for. Of course, the market doesn't care what I think, uh, so it's going to do what it's going to do here. But um, but my hope is that we, uh, we hopefully, with as bad as the, the year started, that what we'll see is uh, a good rest of the year. And some good news and bad news, I guess. The bad news first is that in midterm election years, we typically see the worst corrections of the four-year election cycle. Uh, election years see an average drop of 13%. Pre-election years see an average drop of 11.3%. And post-election years see an average correction of 129 Midterm election years, again, the worst of the four-year election cycle, down 17.1%. But they also have a tendency to see the biggest rally of all four years at 32%. So kind of going back to what I said I hope is going to happen, I hope that we see a nice big rally uh, now that we've seen such a really rough start to the year. The only other couple things I want to sh uh, touch on is, first of all, bonds. Uh, this is the 20-year uh, Treasury bond, U.S. government Treasury bond. Uh, going back to the summer of 2020, uh, bonds are down 18.4%. This chart's a couple days old as well, but bonds have not been doing well. Um, the aggregate bond index, Barclays aggregate bond index, which I do not have a chart for, is down, I think, about 7% at this point since, uh, the eight, we'll say, over the last 18 months. Um, Year-to-date bonds are down. Bonds were down last year on a calendar year basis. Uh, same thing with corporate bonds. Bonds just don't look that well right now, and uh, it's making it extremely difficult for the more conservative portfolios um, because those conservative portfolios have a higher allocation to fixed income investments such as bonds, obviously. So that's making things tough. And then last but not least here before we get into the meat of our conversation is uh, corrections. So when the market has a record correction, we're talking um, the market moves into a correction in uh, less than a one-month time period, which would be obviously be defined as very, very fast. Um, we can go back to 1955, and we've seen one, two, three, four, five, six corrections, not including this one. And uh, we now know that this correction took place in uh, just over, we'll call it 15, 16 days. But the longest of the fastest corrections was, was 20 days long, and that was in 1998 in uh, August. And then the shortest um, was six days uh, in February of 2020. And when you look at the average bounce, rally, rebound, whatever you want to call it, when the market goes through one of these record-breaking, really, really quick corrections like we've just seen, is three months later on average, looking back again since 19, uh, going back to 1950, the average three-month return for the market, S&P, is 7.5% three months later. If we look at the next six months, it's 147 and if we look at a full year out from the bottom, it's 137 So again, more evidence that suggests possibly and hopefully um, we've seen the worst of what we're going to see this year. Um, even though I'm sure that we'll see more volatility as the year moves on. So that was just a quick update on what's going on uh, in the market right now from the standpoint of current events. Um, what I want to talk about today is the fact that investing should be boring. It should not be exciting. If investing is exciting, you're probably doing it wrong. Um, and when we're in our working years, our accumulation years, as we call them, when we're growing our money, um, our accumulation years, we think in terms of rate of return, interest rates, annualized rates of return. And that's fine as long as we're working and we're saving. However, the closer we get to retirement, and especially when we get into retirement, we need to think of things in terms of our distribution years. We need to think compound annual growth rate, CAGR, not so much in rates of return. And there's another reasons for that, but the biggest is because we're taking money out of our portfolio to supplement our Social Security and or pension income then we can't just look at a line on a chart and assume that we're going to be okay over time just because some percentages happen to be positive, um, especially if those percentages are averages. And I'll explain what I mean here in a second here. But investing is a whole lot more than just looking at the Dow or the S&P 500 or the NASDAQ or any long-term 100-year line chart um, or candlestick chart for that matter. And um, as I've heard many of our clients say, uh, who've been shown these charts and said, look, everything will be fine. And look at this 100 year chart is most of us don't have 100 years to live. So since we don't have 100 years to live, um, I don't even know if I want to live that long. I think all my friends would be gone, family would be gone for sure. Um, 
I think that it's important to make sure that we're keeping our, our eyes focused on the on the reality of what these numbers mean and not just looking at averages. I always like to tell the joke about the guy who drowned in a river that was an average of four feet deep, and that's the joke. Uh, that is the punchline. So if uh, if you don't get it, then uh, give it some time. I promise it'll sink in here. So let's talk, let's go over a couple examples of why why should investing be be uh, boring. First of all, if we look at two portfolios over time, that and portfolio A, and and if you're not watching on YouTube, if you're listening on iTunes, I'm going to talk you through this. If portfolio A over five years goes up 25% the first year, up 15% the second year, up 5% the third year, but then year four it loses 5% and year five it loses 20%, that's an average rate of return of 4% per year. Portfolio B, all we did was flip it upside down. So instead of starting with 25% gain, you're, you're ending with a 25% gain. So in, in portfolio B, we lose 20 to start, we lose 5% the second year, then we make 5 the third year, we make 15% the fourth year, and we make 25% the fifth year. In both those situations, the average rate of return is 4%. They're exactly the same when you look at averages, but they're not the same. And this is why. If you invested $100,000 in Portfolio A, which started with growth but ended with losses, your $100,000 over five years would be worth $114,713. If you invested that same $100,000 in Portfolio B because you lost money first before you started making money, your portfolio, your $100,000 only worth $109,000, 109796 if we use a similar example, but this time what we're going to do is we're going to add money to the portfolio, you're going to see how different it gets. So now, again, same story, same percentages, same rates of return. Uh, portfolio A goes up 25, 15, 5, then it loses 5 and 20 in the fourth and fifth year, where portfolio B loses 20 and then loses 5 in years 1 and 2, but makes 5, 15, and 25% respectively in years 3, 4, and 5 but we're gonna add $10,000 per year to both portfolios and see what happens. Again, the annualized rate of return is the same, 4% per year for both portfolios, but if we take that $100,000 and we add $10,000 to both portfolios, what we end up with at the end of the day is $159,000, or in other words, a compound annual growth rate of 7.64% for portfolio A, $159,000, but portfolio B, ends up being worth $182,000, or a compound annual growth rate of 10.65. Why is that? Be, it, the reason why is because we added money early on in Portfolio B at a time when things were down, thereby buying more shares when things were cheaper, so to speak, and then we got our growth later, which gave us the opportunity to make more money as time went on. Whereas in Portfolio A, we still made money, don't get me wrong, it was still a good idea to add the 10000 a year, but because at the tail end of that five-year period, we ended up losing money, we lost 5% and then 20% at a time when the portfolio was bigger, which means you lose more in dollars when it's bigger, which means, obviously, the bigger the volatility of the portfolio, when it's bigger, the more money we lose. And then we're going to talk about volatility here. That's kind of the key point at the end of the day, by the way, is, is volatility. Now, if we look at one more example, uh, what I said a second ago is we added $10,000 per year to the portfolio. Now we're going to take $10,000 out. So again, same story, same portfolio, same returns. Portfolio A goes up 25, 15, and 5. Then in years 4 and 5, it's down 5 and down 20. In portfolio B, we lose 20 the first year, lose 5 the second year. But then in years 3, 4, and 5, we make 5, 15, and 25%. The difference is, again, they're both making 4% per year annualized as an average rate of return, but the difference is this time we're taking away $10,000 per year. So we're withdrawing $10,000 out to supplement our income, let's just say, which by the way, 10,000 per year would be way too much. That's a 10% withdrawal rate. We would never wanna do that, but that's not, I wanted to make these numbers easy. So $10,000 comes out per year. What happens to the portfolio? $100,000 is invested. Portfolio A is worth $70,000. Portfolio B is only worth $47,000. So in other words, the $100,000 invested in Portfolio A, which grew first but lost money later, taking withdrawals out of the portfolio, ends up being down 4.77% per year, whereas in the first year, the, the Portfolio B, which is loses money in the first two years, because we take so much money out early with less time to make it back, 
we end up with only $47,000, or in other words, a negative return of 12.27%, I'm sorry, to 1%, 12.21. So portfolio A lost 4.77% per year on a compound annual growth rate schedule, whereas portfolio B lost 12.21%. So it's, it, when you look at these numbers, this is where things get really, really interesting, and we can't just think about percentages and averages. We need to think about dollars and cents. The last one I want to show you here is a four-year portfolio, <clears throat> and I'm going to talk you through it again if you're on iTunes. Um, portfolio A goes up 10% the first year, up 7 the second year, down 5 the third year, and then up 8 the fourth year. So uh, its biggest year was an up year of 10 its biggest down year was a down year of five, but it's generally probably a more conservative, diversified portfolio. Um, not super exciting, you know. Doesn't really isn't really you know winning any races in the short term here, right? Whereas portfolio B is different. Portfolio B in year one goes up 17 percent. In year two, it goes up 13 percent. In year three, it's down 19 percent, and in year four, it's up nine percent. So the difference between portfolio and portfolio portfolio A and B, a couple differences. First of all, years one, two, and four, portfolio B won. In other words, it won the short-term races, up 17 versus 10, 13 versus 7, and up 9% versus 8 in year four. The, the other difference is in year, when it was down in year three, it was down 19 versus portfolio A being down five. But the average rate of return for both these portfolios is 5% per year. So they're this, again, the average is the same. So they should be the same, right? They're not. The $100,000 invested in portfolio A ends up being worth $120,760. Whereas $100,000 invested in portfolio B, the more volatile portfolio, which we might call the more exciting portfolio, big ups, big downs, is only worth $116,728. So the lesson we want to want to take home here at the end of the day is that it should not be all that exciting to manage your portfolio because volatility is the enemy. You know, you think about GameStop, AM, uh, AMC, Dogecoin, you know, all these exciting investments. You know, if you're going to gamble with your money and you're going to have play money, do it with money you can afford to lose because long term, it, not all markets work out like like uh, 2020, 2021 with the meme stocks. Not a, things don't work like that long term. They might be exciting in the short term, but your losses can be big. You look at things like um, the ARK ETF being up huge, but then being down huge. You look at things like Zoom, Zoom communications being up huge, but down 60%. Teladoc down, Peloton down 70, 80%. Um, you have to be careful and make sure that we're being a little bit more boring with our portfolios if we want to have long-term success. We have to know the difference between skill and luck. Skill is constructing a portfolio that's well-diversified, time-tested, weathers st storms over time, whereas luck is cherry-picking a stock you heard about over the weekend, watching it go up in 50% in one week, and thinking, wow, I'm a really good investor. I think you're probably more of a lucky investor if that were to happen. And then lastly... Knowing the difference between play money and serious money, I think we, if you're going to, again, if you're going to have gambling money, play money, I think you got to be okay losing it. Um, but I think when it comes to your long-term, serious retirement dollars, the, th the money that's going to get you retired and keep you that way, I think we want to make sure that we're being a lot more conservative. Um, and I even hesitate to say conservative, but I'll just say a lot more boring with our portfolio than, being, than making it an exciting experience. So with that all being said, that's it all for today's show. Be sure to share this episode with your friends and family if you think they'd benefit. And if you'd like to discuss your personal situation further, remember that you never have to be a client to ask a question. So if you'd like to set up an intro call, you can email us at info at libertaswealth.com or head over to our contact page at libertaswealth.com and you can uh, contact us there as well. Uh, be, sure, be the first to watch and listen to these episodes and others by subscribing both on iTunes and YouTube. And don't forget, if you head over to LibertasWealth.com, you can sign up to get not only these updates, but also our other screencasts, videos, and articles de delivered directly to your email inbox whenever they're released. Uh, feel free to follow us on Facebook at Facebook.com forward slash LibertasWealth. Again, I'm also on Twitter at Adam Koch, as well as Instagram at Financial Surgeon. And as I always say, there's thousands of podcasts out there, and you chose to give hours a listen today. So thank you so much for joining us, and we'll see you next time. 
Thank you for listening to The Cash Podcast with your financial surgeon, Adam Posh. To see any charts or images that were mentioned in this show or to check out additional articles, videos, and other educational resources, head over to LibertasWealth.com.